When Charles Miglarino died of cancer this month, Oklahoma lost a respected jurist and a distinguished judge. But more than anything, he lived a life of service, volunteering for Vietnam, teaching in the Ardmore Public Schools while also attending law school at night, then a legal career as a prosecutor and a defense attorney before becoming the associate district judge for Johnston County. But Miglarino, never one to brag, would tell you in private that one of his proudest moments was an act of kindness that brought together a family with their long lost brother. Today, we remember his life and his service in a piece we call A Marine's Love Story. I, I got this steak for our anniversary tonight. It's dinner time for Alice and Charles Miglarino. But with a lot of butter. Nothing fancy, even if tonight is their 43rd anniversary. Inseparable through the years, they met in college. Alice, a homecoming queen, and Charles, the big man on campus and on the court. And I did real well at Murray. I, you know, I was uh, uh, sixth highest scorer in the nation in junior college. Oh, I thought, oh, what a nice looking young man. <laughs> <laughs> a budding relationship, yet Charles knew there was something else he needed to do. It was in the dormitory and uh, there was Life magazine, and, and it, was, uh, it was a story about some uh, soldiers. They weren't Marines, they were uh, soldiers. And the officer, who was uh, a 22 year old officer, had called uh, artillery in on them because they were basically being surrounded and engulfed by uh, North Vietnamese. The story uh, mentioned, you know, 18, 19 year olds. And, and, here I am, 17 years old, almost 18 years old, and I'm just sitting in the dormitory. So Charles joins the Marines, off to boot camp at Paris Island, with his love back in Oklahoma. After he joined, he, uh, he wrote me a letter, and he asked me if I'd marry him. I said, sure, and he went out and bought me a ring, and <laughs> that was that. Had it delivered. Had it delivered. <laughs> Came in the, it came in the mail. <laughs> Little time for romance when you're heading off to Vietnam. Shipped to the front lines, Charles found himself along the infamous DMZ. We were surrounded by North Vietnamese everywhere. And it was here he became friends with the old man of the platoon, Mike Ferraro. M M Mike and I uh, were good friends. Mike was... In January of 1968, he, he turned uh, 21. And I was just fixing to turn 19 in February. I would be 19 in February. He was an older guy. Uh, and he had been over there a little longer than me. And, but he had a, a fantastic sense of humor. He'd make fun of everything or sort of, he was the kind of guy that um, was always joking around and always the lighter side of stuff. And you could, he was kind of a, uh, a clown, but, uh, but then you could learn a lot from him. Uh, and uh, I, I knew enough to know that. And we hung out uh, a lot, we, 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 we talked a lot. About life and survival in a land so far away from home. Letters were very important things. Uh, letters are, are the things that you wanted a lot of. You wanted to, you wanted to hear from somebody. You wanted to hear from somebody, uh, you know, that you love. Like going back home, too. Yeah, it's like going back home. It's like being at home. But not all the boys' letters were welcome ones. You're around a bunch of guys who are writing their girlfriends back home. They're getting Dear John letters and stuff like that. You're just uh, trying to keep your girlfriend. <laughs> that's one thing. That's, that's just the reality of it. So Charles had another idea. Rather than write, he taped his love letters on an old reel-to-reel -reel tape player. Damn, I hope nobody else is listening because I feel sort of embarrassed if they heard the lousy tape I'm making up. And if you let anybody hear it, I'll go nuts. Please don't tell me if you do let anybody hear it. <laughs> there was a lot of I love you's in there. Well, I'll say, I say it all the time. I love you a whole lot. I wish I was there and uh, that kind of stuff. And, and um, uh, every time I taped, there were a bunch of guys there. So when Mike walked in without knowing Charles was talking to Alice, you can hear the apologies. And here comes Mike Farrar. 
What's everybody coming here for? <laughs> hey man, what's going on? Put some tape in the what thing. What is this? Everybody's coming in. Is that on now? Yeah, it's on now. I want to say a few words. That's your girl? Yeah, my girl. <laughs> I'm sorry there. <laughs> and while Mike liked to kid around, their job was often deadly serious. And four of us, a fire team, and Mike was in the fi our fire team, four men in the fire team, would go out at night, way out by ourselves, beyond the, the wire. And basically, it's a listening post. Basically, what it is, is if anything comes in at night, you get hit first. Developing a bond that went beyond their years. Yet, boys will be boys. And it was raining and all the time, it seemed like. And we were mostly eating sea rations, but at one point they, would send, they sent out a, a field kitchen and we went out and they put things on these little flimsy paper plates. We were just trying to see where we were going. We had flak jackets on, we had, you had to wear helmets and flak jackets. We, were, you know, we had our rifles with us and um, uh, we're walking along and it's like this, and there are ravines. There's not very many good paths or anything like that. And it's dark. And we both slip at the same time. And the stuff falls down in this red dirt. And Mike looks at me and says, expletive, 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 expletive. <laughs> Let's eat this sh <laughs> So, uh, and... We got that stuff and we cleaned it off and we just sat there in the mud. And we just sat, we didn't even go back to the hole in the ground that we were living in. And we just sat there and ate it. Uh, and, you know, he was joking. He said, you know, damn, if we had some damn candles, I could fall in love with you, you know. <laughs> you, know that kind, you, know, you know, stupid stuff. Two friends, a half a world away from home, living in the harshest of conditions that in a blink of an eye can turn deadly. You know, we went through all this training and, and uh, jungle warfare, you know, -dum 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 -dum, all, all this stuff. And yet we were moving in the same kinds of groups that they moved in the Second World War. Uh, carrying tons of stuff, you could hear us coming for miles. They set an ambush, uh, the North, these are North Vietnamese, and uh, uh, on March 6th of 1968, uh, uh, my company took 38 killed in one ambush, and Mike was one of them. Charles survived that attack, but lost a buddy. After his tour, Charles came home to Alice. They marry, start a family, teach school. Charles becomes an attorney, and now a judge. We pretty much just get on like nothing had ever happened, you know? We had it like a short little honeymoon phase. I took this purse out. And memories of Vietnam began to fade until Alice found an old purse and inside the reel-to-reel -reel tapes Charles had made for her so long ago. And on these tapes, the voice of his friend Mike. And that's the red dirt. Of course, I was the only one that squared away. Of course, I rocked. Riley trying to use your boyfriend here got to put his bolt back right. <laughs> so I had to just find him all, all by myself. It, it, you know, when I heard his voice and I heard he was, what he was saying, uh, I knew he had sisters. And, you know, I knew he lived in Massapequa. And I said, and, and, you know, they haven't seen or heard of him, you know, heard from him uh, since 1968. So Charles has one last mission, to bring his buddy home. They just need to hear this. Okay, we're ready for a couple of interviews. Well, one interview anyway. Here's uh, Mike Farrar, and he's going to give us our opinion, his opinion, excuse me, on Vietnam, what it's worth. It ain't worth nothing. Well, let me tell him about the time I won the Medal of Honor. Oh, yeah, tell him about the time you won the Medal of Honor, Farrar. Charles found Mike's sister and sent her the recordings. Pat? Yes. This is Charles, Pat. Charlie? Yeah. Recordings made with love that gave a sister a final reunion with a beloved brother. I guess I never expected to get, and yet to hear his voice after all these years, and also hear it over there in such a dark place, I just couldn't believe it. I 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 couldn't believe it. I
but how they could still joke, and my brother could still be joking, and um, talking with all that was going on. Um, it just really almost, I almost felt like, oh, I'm getting a little emotional, that I was there, and um, just to hear his voice, but also knew he was with friends. Yeah, uh, Pat, you know, Mike's sense of humor and, and, and all of that did something for me. And, uh, you know, the songs he'd make up about people and, oh, you know, the little, that, the, yes. the, the little songs he'd make up and, and you know, about Riley. And uh, uh, th those, are, those are things that made, that were wonderful things for me. And uh, like I told you, my, my grandkids and my son and my daughter, and, and everybody will know about, you know, they know about Mike. And uh, they've heard the tapes. Uh, and so, you know, without sounding corny, he's, he's li going to live with them. And, and then the other thing is, you know, he's part of my life. And um, uh, I'm not going to forget him. You know, I, I, I forgot a lot of things, and I, and I try to forget a lot of things. And, uh, but... Uh, uh, Okay? Yes. Oh, sorry if I'm a little emotional. So well, I am. Even after all these years, it still comes back. But it just, it, those things touch me, just what you're telling me, because I think that's so great. And not to sound corny, too, but I really love my brother. It's just so nice that somebody else cared about him and just wants to keep his memory alive. And I really, I think that's wonderful. Myself now, the adult, I'm looking back at kids. That's what you and you're listening to kids talk, teenagers, talk about stuff, and trying to be as grown up as the situation warranted, but still kids. And that's what I hear when I when, when, when I listen to that, and you know and, and you know I can't help, uh, you know you know, but think you know, um, it, it's a damn shame, you know. You know, that uh, because they were all good people.